Good day, everyone. I'm John Harrison, and this is Conversations with Great Authors. And we're here today with Gary Goshgarian of Arlington, who is a, an author and a professor of writing and English at Northeastern University. Welcome, Gary, to Thank our event. Thank you, John. Nice to event. be here. So tell us about your writing, how it started. I think most people who write probably were inspired when they're in high school or college. Uh, that kind of happened to me. Um, I did well in, in, in high school and I liked writing, but I decided it, it was the, you know, the, the space age and decided I wanted to go into physics. So when I got to Worcester Tech, uh, majoring in physics, uh, I decided by my sophomore year that I much enjoyed uh, the printed word than electrons. And so I took all the English courses that were there and I decided that what I really need is to uh, to become a writer is to get advanced degrees in English and eventually to teach English and then I'd have the summers off to pursue any writing. Uh, as luck would have it, my first teaching job was at Northeastern University and as even greater luck would have it, my office mate was the famous Robert B. Parker uh, who became very close friends for the next 40 years. And uh, about the third year, we went to jog around the track at Northeastern um, several times a week. And maybe the second or third year, he said, I've got an idea about writing a book. He had just finished his doctorate at BU in the Hard Boiled Hero, detective fiction, and he wanted to write his own. So I watched him demystify the process, and I was chomping at the bit to write my own novel. I was feeling very verbal, but I did not have a story. And um, then, uh, about the same time, in the late 70s, I learned how uh, I could go to Mallorca, uh, Spain, and die uh, and part of a scientific expedition to die for ancient Roman and Phoenician shipwrecks. And uh, I did, and we were attacked underwater uh, by pirates who were um, involved in black marketing antiquities from two to 3,000 years ago. And one day, while we were in about 30 feet of water on the non-jet-setted side of, of Mallorca, uh, a speedboat cut across our bubbles once, a mistake, twice on purpose, or stupid, three times on purpose, and after ten times we were going to be gaffed by pendant anchors dragged on chains behind the boat because we had discovered an archaeological site at 40 feet down. Um, and I said, if I ever get out of this thing alive, I'm, I've got a book. <laughs> wow. And um, we had discovered it was, you know, the very hot antiquities thing. I just moved it to the uh, my favorite Aegean island, Santorini, which was the basis of Plato's Atlantis legend, uh, and that became um, Atlantis Fire, um, which is a, a marine archaeological novel um, based on my experience at Mallorca, and it's one of the most fascinating places on Earth, uh, and particularly in the Aegean. And that uh, was published in the early 80s, and um, in the inspiration of watching Parker write chapter every other day. And, wow. uh, yeah, so, yeah. so none of your future books involved harrowing experiences like Mallorca, but uh, they're kind of a calmer, cerebral uh, yes. attempt. Yes, <laughs> much calmer, once, yes, once they are a, in the life of the mind. Once is enough. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. So, so what, was it um, this association with Robert Parker that really stoked your ambition to write, or did you have it kind of before that and then this just intensified it? And, um, I had the belly fire. I wanted to write, and now that I had a storyline uh, about the, you know, the, uh, the black marketing, um, what he did was demystify the process. Um, he, you know, if you can write a 350-page book, don't see it as a 350-page book. It's like you know, a squirrel does not get go to an acorn the size of a basketball. You, you write five or ten pages a day. Think of a 350-page book as 35, 10 page chapters. And, uh, and so I saw him do this, and that was what made it, it stretch it out, made the process doable. And uh, it took me a year, year and a half to write Atlantis Fire while I was teaching, and uh, it worked. And so in a sense, the watching someone else do it masterfully um, just became, uh, it, I, I, I incorporated that in my, my, pro, my, my, my program to write. Now, with, with your first book, uh, how did, how did you get it published? I mean, how did that, did you, did you get an agent uh, right away, or, or yes. how, did, how did that happen? Right. 
You still needed an agent, and in fact, you did even more so need an agent back then. Uh, Parker set me up with a, a young new agent in his own uh, agency, and uh, he, on the second submission, we got, a, got an offer, a dial press with part of Doubleday. And it was easy back then. It's not easy anymore. And, um, you know, they get very nice advance. They get a good promotion. And, uh, they, you know, it was even optioned at one point for a movie. Um, but that, you know, got my foot in the door. And it's much easier, was much easier then than it is today. Yeah. And did, did, it, um, did that first publication, was that part of a, a three-book deal? Or, or, or was it just that individual book and then later there were other opportunities yes um, it was a, a one book deal okay um, and shortly after that my first son was born then a few years later my second son was born and uh, I was doing um, non-fiction uh, co college textbooks um, which began to eat up most of the time of, of the 1980s it was in the 1990s that once my kids were grown um, I was able to um, do a book every year and a half back back to fiction writing so there was a hiatus of, a, of 12 or so years before the next book came out. Oh, so, yeah. so you, the fire was still there, but the, the fire time was still wasn't. there. Yes, so, yes, no. but we had to pay bills. Yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned it just briefly in passing in, in your response, but we've both been in the book business for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that it's changed a lot. I've been in the business end mm -hmm. until the last couple of years, and you've been in, in the, the writing publishing end uh, for say 40 years mm -hmm. and um, what changes have you noticed in in the book world in the book universe mm -hmm. through those decades mm -hmm. well, positive or negative right uh, right um, positive for those who are brand names in the 80s uh, negative for those who are not brand names in the 80s 20% of all the fiction in America in the 1980s had three names on it. Stephen King, um, uh, Tom Clancy, and Daniel Steele. And I was uh, hired to do, uh, be a, a fiction editor at a small startup company in Boston, no longer with us, um, which had a very good and aggressive program. And because I knew Stephen King, they said, you know, could you, you, know, could you see if we can get a, a, a contract with Stephen King for one, one book? And I called him, and um, the, the option was uh, that if he took this deal, it would be like a $5 million um, contract for him. Uh, and he said he missed me by three days because New American Library just offered me, are you sitting down, a contract for $34 million. So the, the, the 80s were ridiculous. Uh, it was very a piggy. If you give somebody $34 million for the next three unwritten books, there's not left much in the coffers for new wannabe writers. The 90s became more sane. Uh, what happened in the 90s and beginning in the 80s is that large mega corporations started buying up successful publishers in America, uh, uh, organizations most people have never heard of, like Holtzbrink. Uh, and it was a it owned munitions company, a you know, washing machine company, and they had one little finger they wanted to have at the end of their umbrella, um, and all the projections coming down was, was, a, um, was a publishing company. And so what they did was they wanted to buy trophy, have trophy authors. Um, and that was, that made the 90s uh, a, a period where they were looking for brand names, they're trying to make brand names, but the advances were, were a lot lower than the stuff that King and, and um, Daniel Steele were commanding. However, um, at the same time, we had the birth of the internet and the birth of self-publishing, and so things got very, very complicated, as they are today, uh, because people can publish their own books um, and shying away from detouring from traditional publication and traditional publishers. What, what do you see, or do you see, as the future of these changes? I see that as a skittishness in, in terms of the major publishers in America, they're not going to offer many contracts. They've got to make sure that they maintain, the editors maintain their jobs. They have to make sure that they find writers who can sell a lot of books, make a lot of money for everybody. Um, and so that puts a constraint on the publishers and makes them less open to um, unknowns. So what has happened, uh, consequently, you squeeze a balloon at one end, it, 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 it gets enlarged at the other end. With the internet, self-publishing happened. 
and people who could, were not even able, capable of getting an agent who gets 15% of what he or she sells, um, decide on their own to just um, you know, pay to have their books published. Um, that's good news and it's bad news. It's good news for those who've always wanted to get a book published and couldn't find a traditional publisher or even an agent to sell. Um, and it's good because they get something that is offered online, digitally and you know, on demand, print on demand. The bad news is I'm an English professor and I've seen some of the books that get published and many of them are awful. Um, the violations of, of, of basics of, of, of fiction writing, you would have four, four different points of view in the opening paragraphs, which is ridiculous. It's, 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 uh, it's, um, it's jarring. Uh, you don't know who your anchor is for particular scenes and all other, other kind of basic violations. Uh, what bothers me is that as an English teacher, people who buy online books may get some real gems, but they also read absolutely poorly written books and think these are the standards of literature. And, and that is troublesome to me and it's troublesome to colleagues of mine who see absolute, you know, um, some, a few great, liter from a literary point of view, great books, but a majority of them are not so good or even particularly articulate. Now, when are you talking about when you say some books are, are awful and mm. four points of view in the, in the first page? Yeah, yeah. Are these books presented or published by some of the big publishers? No, no, absolutely So you're not. talking only no. about the small, uh, okay. self, A small self-publishing. Uh, you, know, you, you could even use your, 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 your pet cat's name as, you know, okay. as, uh, Daisy Publications. Yeah. And, um, and so it's, you know, they, but, and they're paid. You, you pay to have these books published. Um, I don't like that. I've never had to pay, and I wish people didn't have to pay. Yeah, but sure. given the fact that traditional publication publishers are not taking many books and looking for brand names and pushing those that they think are going to become TV series or, or movies, uh, it's kind of sad, and it really does bar a lot of talented people who are forced to self-publish. What do you think of this new phenomenon, uh, the 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 franchise author, uh, Bob Parker has. The Spencer novels being written by Ace Atkins mm -hmm. and his Sonny mm -hmm. Randall novels written by now Mike Lupica mm -hmm. and uh, this Jesse Stone, I forget who the author is, yeah. but James Patterson is also a franchise right, author. So right, that's right. become, for the top tier, that's become uh, the new phenomenon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I must say, I mean, I, I continue to read Spencer and I think Ace Atkins does a good job uh, w with, with the the way that Spencer, the character is, and the yeah. way that uh, Bob Parker wrote him, and and, right. and I don't know what the future of that is, mm -hmm. but I would expect that if that's going to bring in money to the coffers, that that uh, publishers will continue doing this. Yes. Oh, but what do you think about that uh, as an author, as in fact, as an author who knows Bob Parker? Right. What would Bob Parker think of that? Even though on one hand he might be happy that he's now a franchise that he's so popular. Mm -hmm. But in the sense of purity of um, of the writing style, right, et cetera, right. what do you think of that? Well, in terms of Bob Parker, he's been dead for 10 years, but he's still publishing. Uh, I, I met Ace Atkins. I got to know him, and, and Joan and I and Ace Atkins who were on a radio show together when Ace had done the first Bob Parker book. I was hoping he would choke and, and be totally unsuccessful but it was like he was channeling Bob Parker from on high. I mean, I was absolutely amazed at how he had Parker's voice down. He had the wit down, and he is not, I mean, I, I spent 40 years, Parker's like family friend. Um, he spoke like Spencer. He was funny like Spencer. He was quip, quick and quippy and uh, like Spencer. Ace Atkins is not. But when he's at the keyboard, when he sits down, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's channeling yeah. Parker. Yeah. yeah, and I was astounded, yeah. and I congratulate him for doing a great job. And and that that I could speak to because I, I knew the original. Um, Clive Cussler, uh, James Patterson, they have a stable of writers who do their stuff. Yeah, that's um, a little bit different. It, than, it is than different. Than you know what happens with Patterson? Little I know about him is he would come up with a storyline and he would hire Grant Blackwood or uh, and someone else in his stable to write the book and then Patterson would have the final say in it. Um, and the, the name at the bottom of the, the, the co-author is, is very, very tiny. It would say with or and. 
Um, but it's not Patterson's voice, and it's not no longer the late Clive Custer's voice. Other people are writing the books. Um, if, if people buy them, you know, fine, then it works for them. Um, I have not read the Custer Ghosts or, or Patterson's Ghosts, um, but when Patterson was writing, I recognized the, yes. the voice. Yes. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe his ghost writers are, are just as good as Ace, uh, Ace Atkins is for, for Parker. Interestingly enough, Bob Parker's nickname was Ace. Oh, wow. <laughs> when I first met him, he was Ace, and Ace Atkins shows up and He's oh, got, that is yeah, quite and, a and, and, and Joan yeah. said the same, Joan Parker, um, Bob's late wife said you know, she was amazed not only at the coincidence, but just how good or, and a good a voice he is for Bob. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's that's good for people who love that character. Yes, sure. And there's, yeah. I guess there's a new film uh, due out soon. Yes, I, 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 I Mark yeah, Wahlberg so is going to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. so, so yeah. Spencer and Bob Parker yeah, uh, live it, on. They're still alive, yeah. Now, your, your works are science-oriented. You, you have a degree from Worcester Polytech in physics. Correct, yeah. And, of course, in, in, in English. And so varied um, degrees and... Uh, and experiences in, in the academic world. Mm -hmm. uh, but how did you kind of lean to the medical thriller, which your most recent books are, that, that particular right, genre? Right. I wrote a book called um, Rough Beast, um, which was based on my wife and I moving into our home here in Arlington. And we had gone through the entire place, you know, scouring it for, for lead paint, uh, for radon gas. And I swear one night my wife was in the backyard with a Geiger counter looking for nuclear <laughs> waste. Uh, and we had stripped the house for an awful lot of money and got rid of asbestos and all of that. And it was all based on the, the anxiety, what if something outside gets into the precious bodily fluids of our newborn baby, Nathan? Yeah, reminds us of what's going on today in a way. Yeah, absolutely, in yes. A way. Coincident with that, um, there were terrible, well, maybe a few years later, terrible, uh, a spike in the cancers uh, of people in Woburn, Massachusetts, nearby, uh, which was considered almost a carcinogenic swamp because um, um, several companies were dumping their waste into yeah. it. And that gave me the idea. And so I decided to, to write a book that something bad gets in the water and there's a cover-up that goes right to the White House. Uh, it comes out of the Vietnam era when uh, the government was trying to come up with a, a, a genocide germ uh, to use it in, in, on North Koreans during the war. It, it was scrapped, it was buried in Arlington, Massachusetts, which I call Carlton, Massachusetts. And that gave me the idea, but then I needed to do the, the science. Um, having a degree in physics helped, but not so much in medicine and biology. But I, I knew how to frame questions that get me from A to B and not make me sound as stupid as I, I might have been. Um, and Boston is the medical hub of the sure. cosmos. And doctors love talking shop. Yeah, so your research was the e research easy, was at least access to the, to the world. Absolutely, of, of, absolutely. Of I start with my it. primary and say, get me a neurologist, get me yeah. a cardiologist, get me a, an optometrist, you know, a kind of an optician or whatever. Um, optometrist. And so I, was, I had all these leads. So one of the books I wrote, um, Skin Deep, um, this guy here, is, um, was the toughest one I had. This is involved, as the title implies, it's, it's about beauty and it deals with cosmetic surgery, getting the face you weren't born with, and based on having a face of famous people. The problem was, when I called my primary, I couldn't find a cosmetic surgeon who would sit down and have lunch with me because I, was be, I would have been charged $300 a minute. So for 10 grand, I would sit down and eat a cheeseburger and get some information about a nose job. I couldn't afford that. And finally, uh, my oh. primary called me and said, I got just a guy for you to help you through a facelift, a nose job, a little lift, all that stuff. He was head of cosmetic surgery at Harvard he retired, a man named Robert Goldwyn. He retired, uh, he was widowed, he was still brilliant, and he was lonely. And I descended on him like a, a, a vulture in a zebra carcass. And he gave me 18 hours of, of cosmetic, technical cosmetic surgical procedures, which I laced into the book, not gonna blind the reader with you know, all that stuff. 
but enough to walk me through a nose job and a facelift. And so Boston was the place to be and even found a man to help me with skin Could deep. you have done that book without yeah. his, that knowledge? Yeah. So he was yeah. integral to, yeah. because to getting it done. Because there's always people out there who know technical stuff. Sure. Who always you send you flaming emails, you got this wrong, you can't do that. And, and so there are technical people out there. Um, another book called, um, uh, a rough, uh, I actually forgot which one was that. Uh, another book I had done, um, which I had a, a scene where I had an underwater snake in, in the Virgin Islands, and I got a, a, a letter from an herpetologist, a, a snake person, said, you, you descri describe H. ornatus very accurately. However, the closest one to St. John is in the Barrier Reef in Australia and 7,000 miles away. So, uh, so there are technical people out there. You've got to really watch yeah. your research. Might there be others in this genre going forward? I know you have a big book coming out which we'll discuss in a minute, but might there be other medical thrillers down the road or, um, or science-related? Uh, yes, there, um, um, I, no, not, not uh, one I had finished, which is, it has some medical stuff in there, um, but the, uh, the one that's coming out in 2021, the collaboration, um, has, again, some medical issues in there, but all of my books, with the exception of uh, one or two of them, are essentially based on the theme from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Watch out what you wish for. Mm. Tampering yeah. with, you know, with, yeah. with nature. Yeah. Breakthroughs. I mean, the um, uh, Elixir, this is the first book that we went with a pen name. Um, and uh, I was in Papua New Guinea, uh, and had nothing to do with books, on a diving expedition, and our, uh, our host was uh, one generation out of the Stone Age. And he had bullable watches and a Harvard T-shirt and cutoffs, and he was getting his Ph.D. in University of New Guinea in marine biology. And uh, we went into his village. People didn't wear any clothes. They had feathers in their nose, and pigs were running around. And yet there were reps from Eli Lilly and Merck who were paying shaman, the holy men of the village, in shells for any medicinal plants, miracle plants growing on trees, um, such as digitalis, oh, yeah. such as yeah. quinine, uh, which the, the Americans and Japanese knew. That the reason why New Guinea had, uh, had such battles there is that the chinkona tree, the, car the, 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 the bark of the chinkona tree, had quinine. And if you can have fight jungle warfare, you needed some defense against malaria. And so the point is that I saw these people who were paying uh, shaman in shells because they're too far, you know, real with these very high deep valleys, um, too far from the ocean, never seen the ocean. So you give them these beautiful cowrie shells they can make necklaces with. And I said, you know, what if some guy from Boston went there and a shaman who was a friend gave him a flower that could prevent aging? And that is where yeah. you know, yes. the elixir came from. Really quick. Sorry, someone's mic. Oh, I think your mic fell off. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're fine, I'll fix it for you. Uh, Sorry about that. No, you're fine, I'll fix it for you. Some judicious should we, editing. Should we again. start any of that uh, again? or? Yeah, Katie, where should they start? Start with that. Hmm. No, you already, you already put up the elixir book. Hmm. Uh, what were you guys talking about? What were you guys just talking about last? Well, uh, in New Guinea, New the Guinea and um, uh, miracle drugs growing on trees. And <laughs> what wouldn't it be? And your idea wouldn't it be amazing if you a flower that could stop aging? Yeah, I think that's where yeah, you came you guys, in. Yeah, start from yeah. You guys start from there. Well, uh, you guys talking about the shells, right? The yes, shells. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah talk. Yeah. Start so from did you get the part about the flower? What if? Yeah, yeah. A flower you, could. Um, are they talking about the flower? Did you guys? A flower that could stop aging. Did you get that could, much? Yeah, if you guys want to start from there, that'd, okay. be, that'd be cool. For just after that. That's... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so you so right after the idea that what if there were a flower right, right. that a guy from Boston right. could yep. learn yeah. would save... Right. Stop and, aging. And, uh, and that became, you know, the, the basis for Elixir, um, which is, you know, it's, it's an Arabic name for something that keeps you alive indefinitely, a fountain of youth drug. And uh, that is where the, um, and, and that was optioned for a movie. 
by uh, Ridley Scott, um, who had you know, gotten the Academy Award for Thelma and Louise yeah, and you know, Black Hawk yeah. Down and, and, and Gladiator. Um, and that is the, what was the birth of the pen name. Oh, I was just going to say, where, where did that uh, come from? I was going to ask you that next. Okay, Good. so Good. We, we had this Ridley Scott option for Elixir um, 18, 20 years ago, and it looked like it was going to be a, a, a big movie by a well-named director, uh, anti-aging drug. There have many novels about that. And so they, the publisher called me aside and said, you know, we want to print up 10 times as many of Elixir than the last Goshgarian book. So would you mind changing your name? And I, I said, what are the guidelines? Something short, part of the alphabet. I said, how about Stephen King? That's got a nice ring to it. He says, no, that's taken. And I said, you're, you're joking? He said, we're not joking. I said, okay, I'll change my name. Uh, and I said, uh, uh, front of the alphabet? And I said, yes. So uh, Goshgarian is long, and um, it, it translates from the Armenian as shoemaker, which is O for two, long in the back of the alphabet. Uh, but I found a grandfather of mine who um, was killed in a genocide and, and never, you know, at the age of 29, never left Armenia or Turkey, actually. But his first name translated as brave or braver person. And so I oh, okay. bet so it with my children, my wife, right. Gary Braver, and they said, yeah, it sounds cool. Which is very interesting, and it gives the insight of uh, publishing. Let's go back to the original questions. I called my, it was on Friday, they were told me to come up with a new pen name come up with a pen name, and on Monday I called and my publisher, uh, I got my editor's assistant, and I said, uh, this is Gary Braver, a.k.a. Gary Goshgarian. He says, ooh, I like that. Um, and I jokingly said, can I keep my gender? And I, <laughs> and I hear... It's a legitimate question he, today. Yes. Uh, yes. He wants yeah. to know if we can keep his gender. And then everything is quiet. And they're thinking, we don't have a female thriller writer at Tor Forge Macmillan. And, they, and whereas Random House has Karen Slaughter and, and some of these others. And I said, well, I am not going to change my gender. I mean, not going to show up yep. signing and drag. No, no Carly so, Braver. For, for <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So I stay with Gary instead of you know, Maeve. <laughs> now, I, I know the title of your next big book coming out mm -hmm, soon, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thou Shalt Not. Correct, yeah. And I know we can't divulge your collaborator Correct. or anything like that, but Tell us some of that story, how the collaboration okay, okay. happened. Uh, I, so um, a well-known author came to me a year and a half ago or so and said, would you like to write a book together? And I said, give me a nanosecond. Uh, and I said, of course. So um, we did, and I was doing the male character, um, and the collaborator was doing the female characters. And uh, I decided that a, a good place to set this would be at Northeastern University, uh, involving a 40-ish-year-old college professor. Um, I know I look a lot older. Than <laughs> um, a 40-ish-year-old college professor who gets uh, romantically involved with a student and it leads to kind of a, it's a murder mystery uh, and all sorts of complications as a result of that. Um, and, and we'll see this when? Uh, when do we expect to see, see this publication? Uh, spring or summer of 2021. Of 2021. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thou shalt well, not. Yeah. Thou shalt, that's great. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, as, as we finish, mm -hmm. um, what advice do you have for budding young authors? Um, what I tell them is if you think you have talent, write. And don't stop reading. Read books of people you want to emulate. And don't read them. Study them. Look at them the way a carpenter looks at a house, the angles, you know, the, the efficiency. Um, study how, how the dialogue doesn't sound like real talk, but it's real dialogue. Uh, study the, the economic depiction of characters, how in, in five inches of linear space, you get a sense of a voice of a character, the insides. Um, read slowly, don't speed read. And write, um, take notes. Um, uh, Henry James once said, be one on whom nothing is lost. If someone says kind of interesting kind of uh, uh, turn of phrase, write that down. If a person is, is, uh, has a, a quirk, write that down. I once had an interview with someone who was just finished eating a sesame bagel and took my business card and took a seed out of his teeth. And I thought, this is interesting. This is going to go in a book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for conversations with great authors, and we'll look forward to Thou Shalt Not, <laughs> and maybe we'll come Me back too. here and, and discuss that when it's out. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you, Karen.
Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thank you. That was fun, Gary. That was fun, John. <laughs> I don't. I don't think we left much.